the Saturn V Center here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, the site of Rocket Talk, as we welcome you in alongside John Coward. I'm Bernie Gutt. There's so many big things happening here on Florida Space Coast in the space industry, and that is what Rocket Talk is all about. All the fun That's things it. that are happening in space, and John, almost the second space race has kind of begun. Absolutely. Uh, although it's uh, not for the battle of dominance of the world like the first space race, this one is very important because it has the commercial industry pitting people against each other and it's an exciting time to be here and we're just very busy. Uh, I want people to know that uh, since the end of the shuttle program, things have not let up. In fact, they have gotten busier out here. Well, and the question a lot of people ask is, why is this the Space Coast? But this is where space all began back in 1947. It did. Uh, the reason people came to Kennedy Space Center, or this area, I should say Cape Canaveral, that area back in the beginning, originally we were doing a lot of rocket testing out in the White Sands area of New Mexico. Unfortunately, there was an international incident where we launched a rocket, went over into Mexico. They said, well, we've got to find a better place. Where would be a better place to go? So the criteria they needed was, you want to be closer to the equator. The reason you do that is because the further you get towards the equator, the more spin you get that helps you get to orbit. We also wanted a place that had good weather. We got great weather down here. In the 150 year history of this general area, there's never been a direct strike by a hurricane. So looking at those kinds of factors, easy water access, lower towards the equator, KSC was a great place to come and start to launch rockets. Well, John, in the 1950s and 60s, we had rocket launches almost daily. Absolutely. Uh, that's why they call this place the Space Coast. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, we were learning the very basics of how to get into space. We didn't know what you could and could not do. There were no rules. It was uh, an incredible time. That led into the human spaceflight program. We all remember Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Well, Mercury was the very first one. We had to go find out. First. You didn't know if a human being could swallow in space. Would it go down? You didn't know because we'd never been up there in zero G. So Mercury went up there and proved the very basics. You can get up in space, you can live, you can eat, you can sleep. You can survive in space. Then Gemini came along and it's been forgotten in many ways, but Gemini is the one where we really learned to do rendezvous and docking in space, how to do a spacewalk. We did that during the Gemini program. And that of course dovetailed right into the Apollo program, which of course took us to the moon. Uh, right behind us is the largest rocket ever built, a Saturn V rocket, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. When you come down here, you've got to come see this. Like I said, it is still the biggest rocket, 365 feet tall, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. It was breathtaking to watch one of these things lift off. Apollo 8, the first mission to go around the moon with human beings, that actually created a very iconic moment when they took the picture of Earthrise. And I think that, as much as anything, gave birth to our, our belief in the environmentalism that we have today. People could see the big blue marble and they, they fell in love with their planet all over again. And then Apollo 11, go to the moon, great thing. Uh, John Young, uh, Apollo 16, uh, a fellow Georgia Tech graduate like myself, I'll always plug that. Um, but all the Apollo, so 12 people walked on the moon, uh, an incredible time to be here. And then the Apollo program ends, we go off and we do Skylab program, and then eventually we get around to the shuttle program. When you're talking about the shuttle just down the road at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex, you can see Atlantis up yeah. front. But the last space shuttle flight took place in 2011, so there's a lot of questions of what has even happened in the space industry since the last space shuttle took off. We've actually gotten busier, uh, Bernie, to be honest with you. Uh, the shuttle program was great. That was a fantastic vehicle, but there's so much to do in space and it's becoming, as I said, more commercialized. With all of this going on, uh, we're launching more frequently th than we did during the shuttle program. Not as many humans going out of here right now, but we're actually working on that. I'll talk more about that later. That's a big thing coming up. But you know, if you think about what's happened since the shuttle program, we've had the Hubble up there. Uh, we've launched all kinds of probes to Mars. Several probes have gone to Mars since the shuttle program ended. We've got more coming. It's just an incredible time. And, and while you don't get to see a space shuttle launch, and I know a lot of, the, of our younger viewers, they look at every rocket they see, they call it a shuttle. Well, there's actually rockets in their shuttle. They're different things. You're not gonna see any more shuttles, but there's still plenty of rockets going in. And the cool thing is to be out here on the day of a rocket launch and you will feel the ground shake. You'll, you'll feel your chest getting beat by the, by the sound coming off the rocket. And then someday you're gonna realize that we're gonna put humans back on top of one of those things and how incredibly brave they must be. Well, the great thing about being here on Florida Space Coast is you can find great locations all throughout the Space Coast to catch a rocket launch right up close and in person. James McBall is out in Space View Park in Titusville, seeing what people know about launching rockets to space. 
Hi, I'm James McMullen. We're here at Space View Park on the lovely Space Coast, a mere 15 miles from the rocket launch. We're here to find out what people know about rockets and space. What do you know about Elon Musk? Well, Elon Musk is the inventor of PayPal. Uh, he made $180 million and then he used that to invest into Tesla. He bought that company out and then made it a better company. So quick quiz question, you're sure. wearing the hat, what does NASA stand for? Oh, uh, National Aerospace Administration, I butchered aerospace, yeah. National, uh, yeah, I think it's right in that ballpark. <laughs> so quick quiz question, yes. who was the first astronaut on the moon? Neil Armstrong. There we yeah. go. Canadians know the information. <laughs> Little known fact, Tesla was not created by Elon Musk. He bought it out from someone else and then he put money into it, made it a better company, and then... Is this your first rocket launch? Yes, it is. Where are you guys from? Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage, Alaska? That's far away. It sure is. What do you, uh, Alvin, what do you know about uh, rocket launches here in SpaceX? Um, SpaceX sends them up into space. Well, there we go. Liam, do you know anything? SpaceX was founded in 2002 by Elon Musk and and they are hoping now to go to Mars and the rockets come back down from space. And then he got funding from the government to invest into SpaceX so that he could get these launches that we're about to watch today. I'll be over here, you talk to them. Okay, okay. And then, um, well, the thing about Elon Musk is... Who built the Model T Ford? Henry Ford. What is Captain Crunch's full name? I know this one, it's Horatio Magellan Crunch. If you could send anyone to space, who would it be? You, so I don't have to answer these questions again. Quiz question, who's Elon Musk? Uh, no clue. Yeah, I didn't get it in my notes either, so <laughs> neither of us know. He's also a computer genius that decided to make a space company because he was bored. And the thing about that is... Quick quiz question, who's Elon Musk? Best South African that ever lived. <laughs> Gotta love it. Question answered. There you go. Done. Wrap. Drop the mic. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Once again, I'm James McMullen. We had a great day with all the spectators at Space View Park. Come on down here when you want to see a launch. It's one of the best places to see it. We're 15 miles from the launch pad. Next time you're on the Space Coast, this is the place to be. Well, John, it is so great to have locations like Space View Park where you can catch a rocket launch up close and personal. You absolutely can. There are literally dozens of places around here on the Space Coast for you to come and watch a launch, and you'll get a great view of all of them. Uh, you'll get that feeling, as I've talked about. Uh, if, you're, if you live at my house, you just walk out in the front yard. That's the great thing about being out on the Space Coast. There is no bad place to see a launch. When you think about a couple months ago here on Florida Space Coast, Falcon Heavy taking off, Elon Musk, he's the rock star of everything. Everybody knows what he's done with Tesla. Everybody knows what he's doing with SpaceX. And man, this guy is making some headway. He sure is. And, and I'm very proud uh, that he's out here doing this sort of thing. I'm glad to see somebody doing it. He's kind of pushing us in new directions. And I think that is fantastic. Uh, he's innovative in the way he's doing things. I've worked with dozens of people who told me a few years ago, you'll never land a rocket back on land, much less land it out on a barge in the middle of the ocean. I'm glad he's proven us wrong. I like to see somebody out there pushing the envelope, and Elon is the one who's doing it. But there's other people out here too. You got Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin. Uh, e, uh, ULA is still out here launching rockets. They're getting better at this stuff all the time. There's no shortage of great things. When you think about what is happening, obviously you talk about SpaceX, ULA, Blue Origin, what they're trying to accomplish. But NASA is getting some big things in the pipeline as well. We absolutely are. NASA's got a lot of things coming. As I said, we did not shut down at the end of the shuttle program. Uh, we had to plan because, as you know, many of these missions take a lot of years to make happen, uh, dozens of years in some cases. And there's one launch that just happened recently called TESS. Now, you may remember a probe we launched a few years ago called Kepler. And before that, there was the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble and Kepler did different things. Hubble, of course, was looking out into deep, deep space, into other galaxies, uh, deep into our galaxy. And in fact, in case if you didn't know it, we've only known there were other galaxies for less than 100 years now. So this is how smart we've gotten. But Hubble looked deep in our galaxy, looked at other galaxies. Kepler was actually looking for other planets going around stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Now with the test launch, okay, back up a little bit. When Kepler looked, it was like looking through a soda star. You're looking at a very small location through the sky. You're looking at about 200,000 stars in one direction only. With TESS, we're now actually going to look at 85% of the sky over the course of a couple of years. And what we're doing is we're looking for, when you look at a star, 
Now, I know when a star is very, very far away, you're going to have trouble believing this, but when a planet passes between us and that star that's going around that star, it will actually dim the light from that star a very, very small amount. Kepler could do it, and now Tess is going to do it. They can tell you that, and when you do that, you figure out how long it was eclipsed by that planet going around it. You can get some idea of the size. You know which star it is. And so right now, we know about an extra 3,000 planets going around other stars here in the Milky Way. By the time TESS is done, we're probably going to know closer to 100,000. That is some incredible stuff. And uh, you talked about the select few and the astronauts that get to go to outer space. But one of the things that's so special about the Kennedy Space Center visitor complex here is you have an opportunity to get a complete astronaut experience as well. For more on that, here's Jenna Wood. I'm at the Astronaut Training Experience here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, where you can be part of the next generation of space explorers who will travel to Mars. Today, we're going to be looking at the Mars Space One Botany Lab, so let's get in there. Here at Mars Space One, you will have the opportunity to have fun and go through immersive labs where you will learn a lot about space exploration and what it will take to live on Mars. I'm here with my friend Dee, and she's going to be showing us around the Botany Lab today. My pleasure. So what we're doing here is uh, participating in NASA experiments. They have things growing on the International Space Station and they exactly duplicate those experiments on Earth. What we're doing here is we're using the same types of plants, the same types of lights, the same growth medium, and we're gathering data that then they can use in those controlled studies and eventually in space. Let me just give you an example of some of the things that we're growing here. Would you like to have a taste of our microgreens? Absolutely. There we go. Okay, ready? And pop that in your mouth. Give it a chew. <laughs> so what you're going to do in here as a visitor is you're going to learn a little bit about indoor farming and what NASA is doing to grow plants in space. And you're going to learn that by doing it. So you're going to plant some crops that are part of an experiment. You're going to be harvesting some crops that people planted a few weeks before you. Wow, I had so much fun today at the astronaut training experience learning about all the cool things happening at the Mars Space One Botany Lab. Make sure you check it out next time you're here on the Space Coast. Oh, what an incredible experience it is here on Florida Space Coast. Astronaut training for the visitors that come. But John, you are involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the next yeah. generation of astronauts. I am. I'm working in the commercial crew program right now where I deal with SpaceX and with Boeing. And what we're trying to do is we are trying to nurture private industry to take humans up to the International Space Station. That's been our goal since about 2011 to make this happen. What's going to be very, very cool, Murray, is when we finally get our two providers, Boeing and SpaceX, once they're finally certified to take our astronauts up, they are free to market that capability to anybody they want. And what I would really love to see, the best thing in the world, is if someday a scientist doesn't hand his experiment off to an astronaut for him to go work the experiment, but he takes the experiment and does it himself. Wow. And he does that, those are the greatest moments in science is when a scientist is actually working with something and goes, wow, now that's weird. And that's when real discovery happens. And that's what we're trying to embolden, along with taking people like you and me, who are not astronauts, up into space. And how cool is it? You think about, Jenna just showed us about the astronaut training experience here. But it's quite possible in the near future that you can get a real life demo of that going actually to, to low orbit. Absolutely. I applied to be an astronaut three times, and I never got picked. So now, maybe with this capability, I'll finally get up there where I deserve to be. Well, and John, some of that technology that is going to take humans like you and me to outer space is going on today. And to find out a little more about today's rockets, here's Lindsay Schmidt. Hey guys, this segment is all about the what's what on these different rockets you've been hearing about. Today I'm going to share with you some fun quick facts about the Falcon 9, the Falcon Heavy, the Atlas V, the Delta IV, and the Delta Heavy. Here's what you need to know. Let's get started. The Falcon 9, SpaceX's flagship rocket, it's primarily used to launch satellites and Dragon spacecraft into orbit. The Falcon Heavy is the most powerful operational rocket in the world, composed of three Falcon 9 engine cores generating more than 5 million pounds of thrust. The Atlas V plans to transport astronauts to the International Space Station in the future, utilizing the Boeing Starliner capsule. 
It's had 100% mission success since 2002 with 78 successful missions. The Delta IV rocket was designed to launch payloads from the U.S. Air Force as well as the commercial satellite business. This rocket will eventually be replaced by the Vulcan rocket in mid-2020. The Delta Heavy configuration is the most powerful Delta rocket in the family and successfully launched the first test flight of the Orion spacecraft in 2014. Guys, I want to make sure you never miss another launch on Florida Space Coast. Download the Launch Console app today. Bernie, back to you. Well, one of the rockets that Lindsay talked about that took off in February, Falcon Heavy, man, it made real big headway here on Florida Space Coast. But there's a couple of companies trying to gun to beat SpaceX. And absolutely we are. NASA is trying to do better than that. And what we want to do is we are now in the design and build phase of a rocket called the SLS, or the Space Launch System. This is about as big as a Saturn V, but you take a Saturn V and you put two solid rocket boosters from the shuttle program on the side of it. This is a really heavy lift capability. When that thing goes off, it's going to rattle some windows around here. Now on top of that will be the Orion capsule that we're also developing. This will be the capsule that we'll use to take our astronauts up into low Earth orbit and get them onto that Mars transfer vehicle so that we can start going to Mars, hopefully 2030s. That's the plan. That's what we're working on. Well, it's going to be incredible, and that's one of the reasons why we started Rocket Talk, John, because I just think that we're just really hitting the baseline of what's happening in space, in the space industry. There's so many topics for us to touch upon. There are. And one thing I definitely want our viewers to understand, all the great things that have happened in the past, like the Saturn V behind me, Mercury, Gemini, what Elon is doing right now, that's all in the past. The greatest events in space exploration have not happened yet, and they're coming. It's going to be so much fun. and. That's why we hope you join us here on Rocket Talk as we try to break down all the exciting stuff that's happening here on Florida Space Coast. For the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, John Coward and our entire crew, Bernie Gunther saying thanks so much for joining us here on Rocket Talk and we'll see you next time. John, what's okay. the best space joke that you heard this week? Well, I don't know if it's a space joke, but, it, but it's certainly a nerdy joke, and it's one I learned as a very young nerd, and I've been a nerd for a very long time. <laughs> uh, a hydrogen atom walks into a bar, and he goes up to the bartender and says, I've lost my electron. Have you seen it? And the bartender says, are you sure? And he says, yes, I'm positive. <laughs> Want more Rocket Talk? Subscribe to our channel and be sure to check out our bonus features. Also, make sure to leave a comment so we can know what you'd like to see on an upcoming show.